Good morning, uh, faculty and uh, audience for this uh, Flex Endo course. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we have to start because uh, uh, we want to stay within these time li limits. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Sage's staff to, uh, uh, that they supported that course. Uh, without their help, we couldn't have done it, uh, and they did a tremendous job. I'd like to make a few uh, announcements. Uh, Number one is that uh, SAGES uh, supports education and not marketing, so uh, it does not endorse uh, any product marketing. Uh, and I would ask the faculty uh, for their lectures and also the audience uh, during the discussion rounds to uh, name, uh, not to name brand names uh, if possible and to stick to generic names. Um, um, there will be an evaluation form for the audience uh, that I would ask the audience to fill out afterwards and also for faculty. Um, we have uh, strict time limits uh, for the faculty, for the speakers, uh, uh, which is 15 minutes for each talk. Um, when the last minute starts, you will be alerted by a yellow light, a yellow flashlight, and then you will have a red flashlight when you have to stop, and then you have to stop. I'm so sorry for that. Um, we have a discussion around after each block of lectures, and I'd like to um, uh, refer to our updated agenda, which is uh, in, in the, on the yellow pages in your handout. It's not the, um, the, the agenda which is printed in the, in the handout, it's the yellow pages, and uh, there is a discussion round after each block. We have three blocks, and after each block we have a discussion round for 20, possible 20 minutes. And uh, at that time, we'll have the faculty up at the panel again, and audience can ask questions. And uh, if we get questions throughout the presentations, uh, we'll select the questions and we'll discuss questions. Having said this, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce as our, as our first speaker, Dr. Jeff Hazy from Ohio State. And he will, be talk, he will talk about basics of up endoscopy. Morning. I feel like I'm in the uh, in an aircraft hangar in an aircraft carrier. For crying out loud! So, uh, 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, it's it's kind of difficult to really talk about upper endoscopy, both diagnostic and therapeutic upper endoscopy, and and certainly mention notes in the same 15 minutes. So, I'm going to talk uh, some things that I think are going to be essential uh, for you to know. Certainly, a surgical endoscopist and those who are going to utilize upper endoscopy as part of their uh, part of their practice. This is this is my disclosure slide here. Um, none of these uh, relationships that you see listed here have any impact on my my talk here today. So there's a long history, uh, certainly of upper endoscopy and flexible endoscopy in surgeons. And one of the things I really want to stress with with uh, flexible endoscopy is many of the things that we do today, both as surgeons and as gastroenterologists. Have been, have been introduced to the medical community by surgeons. Certainly gastroscopy, ERCP, and biliary stenting uh, were introduced by surgeons. Colonoscopic polypectomy, we all know about the PEG and Dr. Jeff Ponsky for enteral access. Variceal banding and GI bleeding was first described by surgeons utilizing the flexible endoscope. And more recently, and in current, currently, we see the esophics or the endoluminal treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Barex and radiofrequency ablation for the treatment of, of uh, uh, Barrett's esophagus, also introduced by surgeons. And I think as we move forward in the future, we're going to see a couple of other therapies that are introduced by surgeons, certainly transluminal surgery and the note surgery, which I'll touch on at the end of the talk, as well as an endoscopic uh, bariatric procedure I think we're going to see in the future from surgeons. And this is the list of flexible endoscopic procedures developed by surgeons. Um, you can see here uh, Xinyan Wolf in 1969 with polypectomy, ERCP in 1968, and the list goes on. It's very important not only for us as uh, those who work in an urban community, but certainly in rural, rural America. In the Journal of the American College of Surgeons in 2005, they looked at the average number of cases per year for rural surgeons versus urban surgeons. And the surgical procedures that I've highlighted there, you can see in, in urban 
centers, they perform approximately 77 endoscopes per year. Once you get out in the rural community, almost half of, of a rural surgeon's practice is flexible endoscopy. And really what I hope to do is underscore the importance of flexible endoscopy in your practice. In the Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery back in uh, 10 years ago in 2000, Dr. Demeester commented on esophagoscopy and commented that it promotes surgical comprehension of disease. It can alter therapy due to unexpected findings. It can contribute to conception of an operative plan, facilitates education of the patient by the surgeon, and confidence in the doctor-patient relationship. Reasons of flexible endoscopy training continues to be important, um, certainly for patient care. I think it's better for our patients in a variety of circumstances that I won't get into uh, to be the one performing not only the operation but the endoscopic procedure. Interoperative, uh, interoperative utilization uh, we'll touch on briefly as well. Financial. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, in the rural America, a large part of their practice is made up by flexible endoscopy. Board certification and the eligibility needs of the rural or developing uh, world surgeon, um, very, very important. Um, some may be familiar with, with some of the uh, uh, certification and credentialing issues that have recently come up. Um, and I think we need to be very cognizant of those and continue to perform flexible endoscopy and not lose that in our armamentarium, as well as future treatments that I've touched on, reflux notes and bariatric procedures. So what are some of the uh, indications for upper endoscopy? If you, uh, so you go see a gastroenterologist, um, those are generally pretty broad. Uh, many patients will be sent to gastroenterologists with just vague abdominal pain of unknown etiology, and it doesn't even uh, have to be chronic. Episodic nausea and vomiting, dysphagia, anemia, reflux, or other simple things that we think about screening for FAP and Barrett's esophagus, uh, very important to perform upper endoscopy. As you, as you recall, even after colectomy, the risk for uh, duodenal uh, polyps and upper uh, GI polyps developing in FAP uh, mandate lifelong screening. And then some of the other indications are just for, for Helicobacter pylori um, evaluation and uh, eradication. Again, this is not a completely inclusive list for indications, purely trying to highlight some of the important things. For therapeutic upper endoscopy, there's many, many therapeutic things that we do. And as surgeons, I think we're uniquely suited to deliver therapy via a flexible endoscope. Um, first one is reflux. Streta has come back into the forefront with Madiri uh, Therapeutics. Um, a very viable, very good treatment for reflux disease as well as esophics. As, as we move forward, I don't know if those are going to be the players in the future, but I, I have no doubt there's going to be a flexible endoscopic treatment for reflux disease in the future that will probably serve as primary treatment. Enteral axis. I was once told by Jeff Ponsky that the PEG is the most commonly done procedure worldwide. Revisional bariatric surgery, and I, you may hear some talks today about that um, and the ability to revise stomas, shrink pouches, and whatnot. Um, treatment of lesions, simple biopsy, polypectomy, endoscopic mucosal resection, or submucosal dissection, dilation, a uh, big part of our practice. Patients who are undergoing operation for esophageal cancer or post-bariatric patients very often will get a stricture at their anastomosis and need to be dilated, and we'll talk briefly about that. Gastric outlet obstructions, achalasia. Stenting, esophageal stenting, duodenal stenting, again, gastric outlet obstructions. One of the other indications uh, you may hear some of the speakers talk about today is after a sleeve, uh, uh, gastric sleeve procedure. Very often those leaks are very, very difficult to manage. Um, we've been managing in Ohio State with uh, endoluminal stenting, um, bleeding, foreign body, and then one of the more inter, uh, important ones is intraoperative flexible endoscopy, especially patients who are undergoing a RUI gastric bypass or a, a Heller myotomy to assess the uh, completeness of the myotomy. Overall complications in the upper endoscopy are pretty unusual. Um, overall, it should be under 2%. Uh, with a mort mortality rate less than 0.004%, and this is for all comers. Um, some of the things, as you can imagine, that increase the complication rate 
anytime you're going to do any kind of a therapeutic man maneuver, um, those more aggressive therapeutic maneuvers are going to have a higher complication rate, like endoscopic uh, mucosal resection, uh, delivery of en energy sources, dilation, or placement of stents. Um, careful patient selection and obviously safe technique are, are the best ways to avoid that. Um, I'm just going to briefly touch on perforation. Later, uh, later in the morning session, we're going to have a talk on GI bleeding. Um, the rate for perforation should be in the order of 0.03% or less. Um, typically, it's going to happen in the upper esophagus or at the site of some uh, abnormal pathology, i.e. a tumor or cancer or an area of stenosis. Um, it's greater risk, obviously, with the rigid scope and blind passage. Uh, you really want to try to see where you're going to make sure your posterior um, anterior ostophytes on the C-spine can actually lend itself to perforation in the uh, cervical esophagus, uh, including cervical ribs, strictures, anchors diverticuli, uh, can also increase perforation rates. Over tubes, you have to be very, very careful when you uh, use over tubes. They can become dislodged, and uh, you can actually perforate with the over tube rather than the scope. How do you recognize it? Chest pain, crepitus, cellulitis, the things that we all think about. Uh, obtain a uh, plain film of the neck and the chest and the abdomen. But you want to confirm it, or if you're suspicious of it, use a contrast study. Repeat upper endoscopy is, is not very useful for perforation because you, you won't see it. Um, part of uh, the perforation risk is actually with dilation. Um, and there's a number of techniques to avoid complications. You have to be very careful about who you select and how you control a patient's airway if you're going to dilate those patients. Um, have different modalities available, a bougie, wire-guided or non-wire-guided. You may need to have fluoroscopy available. Or you may be more comfortable dilating them with balloons. Uh, you have to be comfortable in the technique that you're doing and know the anatomy. Very often patients will get sent to us that have had uh, other operations and other procedures, and sometimes the anatomy can be confusing, so I will actually either speak to the surgeon or get the uh, copy of the operative note. This is probably the most important slide regarding perforation and risk factors of perforation. Uh, and the only thing, the only purpose of this slide is to really highlight the idea that when somebody perforates during therapeutic upper endoscopy, when you're dilating them, it's not a function of the method of dilation you use. It's a function of the pathology. Um, and as I highlight there, the risk is more dependent on pathology than the, the technique. Obviously, malignant uh, lesions have the highest risk of perforation. Uh, peptic, uh, peptic lesions actually are pretty low for peptic ulcer disease in the order of 0.1 to 0.3 percent. How do you manage this? Uh, defined the underlying anatom uh, anatomy and the pathology that resulted in the dilation, whether this was an obstruction or a tumor. Um, antibiotics and MPO for a cervical perforation. If this fails, you may need to explore the patient's neck, mediastinal, or distal esophageal perforations. Very often will mandate surgical exploration. I want to talk about enteral access very briefly. Again, in 15 minutes, I can't get into too much detail. Um, for the placement of pegs and pedges, uh, there's, there's a little bit of controversy of what's a contraindication. Uh, and I list them here. As you notice, many of these are relative contraindications. Um, pharyngeal or esophageal obstruction is a complication. Uh, ascites is a relative complication. It used to be, I used to consider it an absolute con uh, contraindication, but for these patients, very often I'll get a CAT scan. If their ascites is loculated or limited to one part of their abdomen or, or very minimal, I'll go ahead with the procedure. If it's a large ascites that's free floating in their abdomen, I will not. Same thing with peritoneal dialysis. I'll make sure they're dried up for a period of time before I'll go ahead and put the uh, the peg in. Uh, VP shunts kind of treat those a little bit like a peritoneal dialysis catheter. Very often, VP shunts have uh, uh, loculated fluid collections. Um, previous surgery, obviously, uh, uh, relative, it's always worth taking a look with the scope. Um, inability to localize, required for a short duration, that's up to debate for debate how long you need to have a, uh, a peg in order to indicate uh, one being placed, and malnutrition. Complication rate for enteral access and upper endoscopy should be about 6%. Um, obviously, gastric or jejunal leakage can cause peritonitis. Tube dislodgement in the first four weeks can be a problem. I don't automatically take them to the operating room if that tube gets dislodged. Certainly after two weeks, I'll just I'll bring the patient in, put an NG tube, bed them down, uh, put them on some antibiotics, and wa watch them. Um, inside of two weeks, my threshold goes down for, uh, for operating on those patients. 
I want to talk briefly about intraoperative evaluation of utilizing upper endoscopy. Um, we use it very often to uh, follow our Heller myotomy. Uh, look at the extent of the myotomy. I think it's very important for surgeons to continue to do that. I don't think it's a good practice to pull your gastroenterologist in because you know what you're looking for, you know what you want to do, and what I, th I think we really want to try to do is avoid some debate as to what's an adequate myotomy with our GI colleagues um, after a RUI gastric bypass or a application evaluation of an anastomosis, um, a following resection procedure. Uh, to confirm lack of residual disease or localization of occult GI bleeding. Take these patients to the operating room, they've had a pill endoscopy, they see an AVM, of course you can't localize it, you don't know where it is. Open up the stomach, stick a scope in it, telescope the bowel and the scope in the operating room with the belly open. Um, it's a very quick, easy, uh, safe and effective way to find occult GI bleeding. Briefly, I'm going to make a couple of comments on, on notes. Um, Notes is obviously what you can think of as access, either transoral, transanal, transanal, transvaginal, or transurethral access. There's 10 challenges to notes. This was outlined a couple of years ago. Um, access points, how you're going to close your access point. It doesn't have to be a GI access point. How you can prevent infection, development of suturing and asthmatic devices, spatial orientation. It goes on and on, as you can read there. Um, the thing I want, to, I want to make very clear for notes, uh, uh, what we've established thus far and describe it as a translational technology. In 2011, I think we've established six things. Again, in the interest of time, we can't get into these, but it has a track record of procedures. Notes is not new. Access is feasible and it's safe. We can get into the uh, peritoneum via these various access points. Contamination, either transgastric or transvaginal contamination, is clinically insignificant. You can safely insufflate the peritoneum via flexible endoscope. You can visualize uh, for staging and diagnosis. And interperitoneal therapy, and it's a very general term, can be delivered safely via transgastric transgastic route. You've got to get over the fact that notes is not new. Everybody in this room has actually done a notes procedure. There is a track record. You've all done PEGS. PEGS is a transluminal procedure. It's a note procedure that's been around for over 20 years. What we're really doing now is just trying to find our way in notes and find out what procedures are amenable to uh, transluminal therapy. Uh, this slide was from last year. I left the 2010 on it on purpose. Um, it's feasible, but so far it's really been limited to simple procedures. Uh, colbocystectomy and appendectomy, I don't think that's the future of notes. Um, but usually, at least in 2010, it's going to require some sort of percutaneous assistance. It also fits in with therapeutic trends. Therapeutic trends for TEM, EMR, um, the transoral incisional Heller myotomy, if, it, if it, anybody hasn't seen that yet, it's a very uh, unique procedure where you actually go through the submucosa and tunnel down in the submucosa of the esophagus to do a Heller myotomy endoscopically. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful technique. I firmly believe reflux will be treated endoscopically in the future as well as a bariatric procedure. Where is it going? What are some of the future indications? I think certainly as a diagnostic tool. Uh, we may use it as specimen extraction site. Relatively simple procedures. I personally am not sold yet on appendectomy and cholecystectomy. Um, new applications of it, i.e., an endoscopic Heller myotomy, uh, and old applications will continue to be important, including uh, enteral access and cystgastrostomies. Understanding, very important, that notes is a translational technology. The knowledge, instrumentation, and skill developed during a notes revolution has unimaginable applications. And I think the ultimate application that we'll be doing, uh, we don't know right now. We're going to apply new flexible technologies in ways we cannot envision, and success is about the journey, not the goal. Thank you for your attention.